Hi everyone, my name is Delphine. I am the head of activism and community engagement at LaShaw, the International Sexual Health and Wellness Research Institute. And I'm so happy to be here on behalf of LaShaw to support Mumu Network and the Spokes Hub Initiative. Now at LaShaw, what we're trying to do is essentially improve the sexual health and well-being of people worldwide, but we also work to improve the sexual health and well-being of sex workers in particular. We do this through numerous ways, Mainly, we advance sex research. We also develop initiatives that are going to improve the well-being of sex workers and people in adult industries. And we're also trying to positively change public opinion because we know that stigma plays such a huge role in the issues faced by sex workers. Uh, now, one of our initiatives that we are super proud that we completed this year is the Community Advisory Board. So we put together a Community Advisory Board of CAM models who are advising us on some of the most pressing issues that they face in their profession. So we use this advice to develop initiatives that are going to tailor their needs and target those issues. And the Community Advisory Board also advises us on ongoing projects so we can really be sure that the projects we're doing are centering sex worker perspectives and experiences. Now, if you're interested in that, I welcome you to go to our website, lasha.com. You can also find a lot of articles on there written in a very accessible way about sexual health, sexual wellness, but many of them are actually about sex work and sex workers, so that might be of interest to you. We're also on X, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so lastly, I just want to take a moment to thank New Moon Network for building such supportive and empowering environments for sex workers. We need more of that in this world. And on behalf of Lasha, I just want to congratulate you all on your achievements and wish you a happy graduation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mandy Sally. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Woodhall Freedom Foundation. And I'm really so thrilled that we are hosting this Spokes Hub graduation. I believe this is our fourth cohort of Spokes Hub grads, and that's awesome. It's really exciting to see the growth and the number of people who've completed the program and who are out there in the world doing this amazing advocacy work. I want to just give a huge shout out, a huge thank you to the Spokes Hub team who creates all of these fabulous classes and helps steward all of our fabulous graduates through them. So thank all, thank you to all of you for choosing Woodhall as your program home for Spokes Hub. We are honored to be a part of it. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing everybody's work tonight. I always leave Spokes Hub graduation feeling incredibly inspired and excited about the work that you're all going to go out and do, or in some cases are already doing. So thanks again for having me. Um, folks, if this is your first graduation, please check out the Spokes Hub graduations on our website, on our YouTube page. And without further ado, let's get into it. Thanks, Mandy. It's great to have you with us today. And thank you to Woodhull for joining us at New Moon Network on this important program. My name is Savannah Sly, and I'm the founder and co-director of New Moon Network. New Moon is dedicated to advancing the rights and welfare of people in the sex trade through funding, leadership development, and philanthropic education. One of our goals at New Moon is to create an ecosystem of opportunity for individuals with lived experience in the sex trade, such as programs like this, Spokes Hub. We're grateful to our allies at Woodhull Freedom Foundation for joining us on this important program. We're also deeply thankful to the LaShaw Sexual Health and Wellness Research Institute for their financial and technical support. And of course, we're especially thankful to all of you at home for joining us today to celebrate our graduates. Thank you. And today we also have with us all of the Spokes Hub coordinators. This is an amazing team and uh, I'm just so thrilled to be able to work with you all. Um, on our team, we have Jose Rico, we have Jay Leo Shiro Brantley, and we have Moses Moon, also known as Thought Scholar. And today, we'll all be leading you through the graduation. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the summer 2024 Spokes Hub graduation. We're excited to be graduating our fourth cohort from this program, which began in 2022. And we are immensely proud of all the graduates who will be sharing today their original presentations that they put immense thoughts and time and effort into. 
Spokes Hub is a virtual academy aimed at supporting people with lived experience in the sex trade in developing their voice and authority as advocates. It's also free. Participants are encouraged to deepen their understanding of complex issues through peer support, peer learning and research, and to expand their advocacy skills through writing and public speaking. Part of the purpose of Spokes Hub is to recognize the valuable contributions of advocates with lived experience in the sex trade. The graduates whose presentations you're about to witness will now have access to a financial awards pool that offers stipends of up to $250 for public education work that they conduct, which is otherwise unpaid. To date, the awards pool has distributed over $16,000 to past graduates across the country engaged in public education and advocacy work. In order to ensure that Spokes Hub is a high quality and relevant program to its participants, we have intentionally grown the program slowly but steadily. And we're proud to share today that this summer cohort represents our largest graduating class to date. If you're a person with lived experience in the sex trade, or if you consider yourself to be either a survivor of exploitation or a consensual adult sex worker, we invite you to take free classes at Spokes Hub. On with the show. First up, Evelyn V is an artist and advocate working in a kaleidoscope of mediums, including textiles, photography, lino cut, zines, and performance. Harm reduction, sex worker rights, and gardening fill the rest of her time. We're so glad to now introduce her presentation, How to Become a Resource Magpie, Collecting Information for the Collective. Alrighty, my name is Evelyn, and I'm going to be presenting on how to become a resource magpie. So this is something that I've begun referring to myself as I really enjoy finding, collecting all kinds of information and knowledge. And I realize that this is a skill that can be uh, somewhat hard to learn if you haven't come from a, a similar background. Um, but there is so much available and there's so much out there for us all to find. Um, so the Internet has been a remarkable tool for connecting sex workers since the days of message boards and now social media. Uh, previously, this information had to be found in person, in dressing rooms, you know, on the street, finding people. And now we have this wealth of information online. And led, there's been lots of legislation that has tried and in some cases succeeded uh, to pull down that information. However, there is still quite a bit available for us to use. So if you love research or you just love to read, love collecting knowledge, you might be a great candidate for becoming your local librarian, so to speak, or resource house mom. And this can be in a variety of roles. You can be doing policy research to influence local, state, or even national legislation. You can be educating service providers, healthcare providers, other system organizations in your locality about sex worker needs. Um, you, you may just be the safety maven for your local community and are focused solely on safety and privacy information for your fellow workers. So first, some general tips on how to effectively do this. Uh, organization is number one. So you will, when you find things online, make sure you're bookmarking them. Uh, more importantly, even than that, is back up your bookmarks. You can Google how to do this. 
And that way, if something happens, you will at least have your bookmarks. Uh, I have a, a little funny tweet over here about when you close your browser accidentally with all of your unsaved tabs open, um, do not let this happen to you. <laughs> you may also want to download files and make sure you rename them to something that's easy to find, date, the author's name, and a, tight, a simple title that will make sense to you. Information that you forget you have or you cannot find is as good as not having it. So organization is key. Uh, preservation of that research. Websites go down all the time. Uh, there were several things I was even looking for for this presentation and they are gone. So when you find something that you find valuable, uh, download the PDF, take, you know, copy the information into a Word document, do whatever you need to do to preserve that information locally. Uh, put it on a hard drive, when it possible, print out hard copies. You can do this for pretty cheap at a library. You can do it for pretty cheap at um, an office supplies and printing store. This can be really nice to have, especially if you are like me and you cannot read off of a screen for a really long time. Um, dissemination of your research. Having it and not sharing it is just hoarding and that's not helping anybody. Um, so this may look differently depending on what you've chosen as your role, what your community looks like and what your goals are. So it may look like printing off zines and fact sheets that you find online and having them available in community spaces, in outreach, just handing to other people, bringing to the dressing room, bringing wherever they are needed. It may look like pulling together research about policy outcomes and using that to influence policymakers, stakeholders, local legislation, wherever it's needed. Um, this could also look like sharing safety information to workers, either screening practices, um, privacy practices, bad date lists, things like this. Um, it is important to be, in this case in particular, to be mindful of privacy and safety. Uh, you will want to share these in a discreet fashion, which brings us to the next point, which is your digital hygiene. So it's always good to use safety tools like a VPN, services that use end-to-end -end encryption, like Proton services, um, Signal for texting, Jitsi for video meeting. Um, you also don't want to use any of your work credentials or work names signing up for things uh, like a library or JSTOR or wherever you might be doing your research. Um, you also may wanna consider what information makes sense to keep on your computer for easy access and what might make sense to keep on a hard drive. And this is a risk assessment that may shift depending on travel, if you share a computer, what your risk is for hackers, things like that. Okay, so now uh, we're going to, I'm gonna give you a little taste of all the different places where you can find information. Um, my goal is to teach you to fish, not give you the fish. So uh, JSTOR has recently offered a sign up for free um, for independent researchers. WorldCat is another free resource for journal articles. The Internet Archive is an incredible wealth of archives, films, books, so much stuff. Um, definitely use that while it is still available. Your local library. Um, often their websites will have archived newspapers and lots of other documents. So don't pay for a newspaper subscription, simply look at it the next day on the library. 
uh, Libby is another app that all you need to use is your library card and you can access tons and tons of books for free. Amnesty International, um, the International Network of Sex Work Projects and Hacking and Hustling are a few other spots that have some good research and uh, other materials on sex worker rights, labor rights, things connected to our work. Um, newspaper archives can be found either on the newspaper site or in the library. Another hot tip for accessing journal articles that are behind a paywall is to simply find the author's name. Their email will usually be linked, email them for a copy, and they will be happy to give it to you for free. So this is a workaround to paywalls. Um, the authors do not get the money from a journal subscription. So they do not mind sharing their work with more people for free. Um, 12 Foot is a web tool that will sometimes allow you to bypass a paywall. So that's an option. Uh, Scribber is another online tool, mostly for citations, which I really recommend in being able to keep all of your sources straight, particularly if you're having to do citations for something you're pulling together. It also is an additional backup to uh, prevent losing those sources. That has definitely happened to me where the bookmark got closed, but fortunately I had already put it on my citation list so I could find it again. Okay, researching public health and things for your personal health. World Health Organization and the National Harm Reduction Coalition are good places to start to find various research on health outcomes for sex workers and the health issues impacting our population. Um, there is also on Psychology Today an option to search for a sex worker allied mental health professional if you are looking for care for yourself or someone else. Um, and I've also linked in here a, a little recommendation on things you may want to ask a therapist when screening them uh, specifically to help you uh, as a sex worker. Safety. Um, I've popped in a couple of things here, an example of a zine and publication from sex worker orgs on various safety, you know, screening safety protocols that you may want to consider. The Electronic Freedom Frontier and the Digital Defense Fund also have some really great information on digital safety, um, operational security, risk assessment, all these things that we need to keep ourselves safe as both sex workers and activists. Uh, the other old fashioned safety is connecting with other workers and advocates online and offline. Make sure that if it's someone you really need to stay in touch with for, you, for your safety or your work, uh, that you make sure you have some way to contact them that is not on social media in case you lose, you or they lose your accounts. And uh, legislation systems and policing. You can look up congressional legislation and other government information on the uh, US Congress website and GovInfo. There is also Rate That Rescue, which is a website that will give you the scoop on what uh, usually anti-trafficking organizations do, what how good they are, um, so you can know who you might be getting involved with. There is also much to be found by reviewing your city council agenda. Um, they sneak a lot of stuff in there and you may find out a lot if you're also trying to work for local legislation or change. Um, make friends with a paralegal. They know how to find stuff. They are really good at it for their job. 
So that is a great ally to have in your corner. Along with that, learn how to submit a FOIA request. This is particularly important if you were uh, going to be looking into policing systems, legal systems, things like this, where information may not be readily publicly available. You will also want to look into your local legal codes to see what actually is stated and also what charges may be called because they can be called all different kinds of things if you're looking for a certain you know, arrest data or something like that. So you need to learn what actually you're going to be looking for. Um, the other really juicy thing that seems dry, but boy, is it not, is all of the publicly available information you can find on city and county websites, uh, real property records, a public index about people's legal histories, uh, court dockets, who contributed to certain candidates' campaigns. All of this is public information and you can find out so much uh, from going into these. Um, every city and state is a little different. Some are easier to use, some are less, uh, but there is a lot to be found if you familiarize yourself with how to use them. And lastly, and equally as importantly, is doing the research on things that bring us joy and make us happy and are the, you know, the joyful side of revolution. Um, I just highlighted a few that have been on my radar recently. There's a wonderful film called Whores on Film, documenting sex workers in uh, film media. Blue Stockings Bookstore has a great section of sex worker literature. AK Press is publishing things. Working Girls Press is a new press that just began that will be publishing more. Um, Joe Weldon has an excellent substack. She's going to be coming out with a book about how sex workers have influenced style. Um, and then, of course, supporting and looking up and cataloging businesses run by sex workers, sex workers creating art, sex workers offering services. All of these things are, are just as important as the, uh, the more nuts and bolts research as well. So that is all. Um, I hope you have fun researching and um, yeah, good luck. Thanks, Evelyn. Next, Tatiana Furman is the founder and CEO of Bridges for Life, working to support teens and young adults on the street and in foster care in becoming responsible and confident adults. Tatiana wears many hats as an ordained minister, plus size model, actor, writer, wife, sister, mother, and most importantly, an Afro-Latina trans sister of our community. We're excited to introduce her project, the Safe New Jersey Campaign. Hello, my name is Tatiana Furman, and I am the CEO and founder of this lovely organization called Bridges for Life. Bridges for Life is based in Hackensack, New Jersey, and in New York. We cater to fostering homes, and safe places for individuals coming out of foster care system, black trans sex workers, unfortunately still trying to survive, and indigenous folks coming from all over the world undocumented seeking asylum shit. My organization created this campaign called the Safe New Jersey Campaign. So what is the Safe New Jersey Campaign? First, let's break down safe. The word safe in our campaign stands for sex workers access to fair employment. This is a campaign where its leadership is through sex workers advocate and sex workers currently and past. The goal of this campaign is not to recruit 
not to get sex workers, not to teach nobody how to be a sex worker. It is to show that this campaign stands for something. It stands for the lives of sex workers all around the world. Sex work is work. And that is a statement that is very realistic in our community. So this campaign focuses on building leadership, acknowledging the girls that want to be involved in the fight advocate for sex workers, but doesn't know how to start, doesn't know what to say, doesn't know how to go about it. So we use this campaign to build each other, teach each other rules and regulations, and just uplift each other and build us to be good advocates for sex workers. Sex work is the oldest profession in the world. And the earliest mention of sex work makes the profession 4,400 4, years old, which puts, clo which puts it close to precise as one of the oldest professions of all time. Evidence for prostitution as an occupation dates back to 24 BCE. This is why it is important to acknowledge that sex work is work and that it does exist. We have sex workers all around the world, many different levels and many different platforms. We see girls on OnlyFans. We see your strippers at the hottest clubs. We see uh, sex phone operators. But then we see the community that's living in the back ends of the street. Literally sex working to survive, selling their body for 20 to $40 a pop, because that's all they have to do to eat and survive. It is important that we acknowledge this. Throughout the years, we have different days that commemorates with certain parts of our sex life. For example, January 1st, we acknowledge that day as human trafficking awareness, designed to educate the public about human trafficking and the role they can play in preventing and responding to human trafficking. Another day that we have is March 3rd, International Sex Workers' Rights Day. Sex workers and advocates organize protests, gatherings, art shows, and lectures across the globe to raise awareness about the human rights abuse sex workers face. June 2nd, one of my most favorite days, International Horse Day, better known as Sex Workers Day. International Horse Day or International Workers Day honors sex workers and recognizes their often exploited working conditions. December 17, International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. Sex workers are often usually targeted and abused. Observed annually on December 17 by sex workers, their advocates, friends, and families, and allies, Violent crimes against sex workers go unreported, underaddressed, and unpunished. This day is important to acknowledge the sex workers throughout the world that has been murdered or done violence to due to their choice of sex work and occupation. The red umbrella is a symbol for sex workers' rights. First used in Venice, Italy in 2001, the symbol perpetuates inhumane work conditions and humane rights abuses. The day calls attention to hate crimes committed against sex workers worldwide, as well as the need to remove social stigma and discrimination that have contributed to the violence against sex workers and indifference from the communities they are a part of. You often hear 
legalize or decriminalize. The difference between legalization versus decriminalization is all there. As you can see, the first sentence grasps me because it allows only licensed workers and clients who participate in the regulated market to report crimes committed against them. That means that girls are still working underneath someone's authority, still at risk of their exploitations, the things that goes behind closed doors at work, versus decriminalization. It enables all sex workers and their clients to report crimes committed against them without fear of prosecution. This is a map that shows the current status of, legal, of legalized prostitution. A number of European countries have legalized prostitution in which selling sex is allowed under certain circumstances, but paying for it is not. They must register within the state, have a professional certificate, and work in a licensed brothel. Belgium is the first country in Europe to officially decriminalize sex, selling sex, paying for it, and working with sex workers. New Zealand decriminalized prostitution in 2003. This is a map that shows the different countries and states. As you can see, Maine is the only US state to have neo-abolitionism or the word that we might all know, Nordic model. While Nevada has some legalization. If you zoom in and study this map, you will see the different shades at the bottom, which will tell you the different status of that country. So what is the Nordic model or neo-abolitionism? Nordic model, criminalizing the buyers, decriminalizing prostitution, helps to get out of prostitution, awareness and education campaigns for the public. This is what the Nordic model stands for. And if you, from the outside looking in, you probably think like, well, this is a good thing. Why wouldn't you want this? Well, it still puts our sex workers at risk. By criminalizing the buyers, the very same people that are providing for the sex workers to survive and not decriminalizing the prostitution act makes no difference. You're taking away the buyer, you're putting the girls at more risk to work deeper in alleyways because now they might fear that their jobs might think they're working with the police. You are more risk of, of having police presence, presence all around your area, staking out, waiting to see if you have a John so that they can arrest your John. That makes it a domino, that creates a danger domino effect on all sex workers, pushing them into the back corner, giving them less chances to negotiate better pay or safety conditions. Some of these bills and laws like FOSTA and SESTA are harmful policies which govern sex work that criminalizes sex workers' clients for purchasing services, forcing them to work in secret. This is a story of Rhode Island Rhode Island and legal indoor sex work. So by mistake, Rhode Island was stuck in a period of seven years with legal indoor prostitution. A sex worker in the community was arrested and charged. Her lawyer came and fought to bat and saw a little gap and used that to his advantage. The bill 
created did not mention anything about indoor sex work. And so for that reason, it became legal for that seven year period until Rhode Island was able to correct and re-ramp and reword their bill. Pushing sex work on the ground makes it dangerous. Workers are forced to work in secrecy, which can harm their safety and livelihood. The criminalization of consensual adult sex work is a violation of human rights. This is a story of a dear friend of mine, Cecilia Gentelli, who unfortunately has left us all too soon. Recently, as a minister, I had the privilege of marrying her and also officiating her funeral. Cecilia was an amazing person and a very true advocate to sex workers' rights. She was a prominent figure in many bills that have been passed and bills that are being worked on right now. Cecilia Gitelli created the Coin Clinic, which is a clinic that is very dearly to my organization because it allows me to surface the clients that are coming from all over the world, Nicaragua, Mexico, Jamaica, undocumented to seek gender affirming care, hormonal therapy, and STD screening. The story of CC, Yang Song. You might've heard the story of CC a massage parlor owner in Queens, New York, who allegedly stated by the article and police officers that she jumped to her death. Cece was an amazing person described by people that knew her. Cece was uplifting. Cece had turned a new wheel. Cece was creating her life and changing things for the better. We believe CC was forced. We believe CC was coerced. We believe CC was murdered. The solution is simple. Decriminalize sex work. We encourage you to call on Congress to reappear laws like SESTA, FOSTA, which have pushed sex workers and trafficking victims into more dangerous and exploitation situations. Bridges for Life aims to make progress towards equity and bodily autonomy. No one should be criminalized for making choice about their own body. Decriminalize sex work, decriminalize abortion, decriminalize choice and maximize consent. If you wanna tap in and help out this campaign and learn how to be an ally, these are ways to be an ally. Don't assume or judge. Respect personal boundaries. Address your prejustice. Respect that sex work is real work. Don't play rescuer. Realize sex work transcends race, gender, class, etc. Don't let stigma and bigotry continue. Thoughts and feedbacks, this is the end. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this presentation. My contact information is contact at bridgesforlife.org. You can look at our website, bridgesforlife.com. Sex workers matter, you matter, I matter, we all matter. That was great, Tatiana. Now we have Josie Oakley, who's been involved in Pittsburgh sex work advocacy for over five years. A lover of diverse tactics, you can find her making art and crunching numbers in equal parts. Now introducing her presentation, passing a local law to reduce jail time and fines. Hi, my name is Josie Oakley. I'm coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is in the center part of the United States. 
And I'm here to talk today about an initiative we're working on in Pittsburgh to reduce the jail time and fines for prostitution by passing a local law here in the city. So some background to start. Uh, in my state in Pennsylvania, prostitution is a misdemeanor. In most states, crimes are graded based on how serious they are. So they're usually categorized as criminal or civil. Prostitution is a criminal charge in most places. And then after that, the criminal charge is graded based on how severe it is. And a misdemeanor is one type of grade. It's usually a lower level criminal offense. But what happens when you get a misdemeanor, a conviction, is that the judge can decide basically what your punishment is, what your penalty is after that. There are guidelines in the state code for how to sentence um, after a misdemeanor. So for your first offense of being convicted of prostitution, you could get up to one year in jail uh, and a, also a fine. And if you keep getting convicted of prostitution, those penalties will increase to up to five years. So obviously we don't love that. <laughs> There's no reason why uh, anyone doing sex work should end up in jail for a crime that has no negative effects on society. But we decided to take some lessons from another similar crime, which is minor possession of marijuana. So like us advocates in sex work, cannabis advocates have long been fighting to decriminalize marijuana, since again, it is also a crime that has almost no negative effects on society. In Pittsburgh in 2016 and in Philadelphia in 2014, both those cities made a local ordinance to change minor possession of cannabis from a misdemeanor to turn it into a summary violation. So following their head start, we were thinking, well, could we do this with prostitution here in the city? So the goal of our initiative is to change prostitution from being a criminal misdemeanor to being a summary violation. Summary violations are also called non-traffic citations or summary offenses. There might be a similar thing in your state under a different name, but it's basically the most minor type of criminal offense. And it could be something like um, loitering or um, you know, retail theft, shoplifting. So the effects of downgrading the grade of prostitution are that you go from having large fines down to a small $100 fine. And instead of up to one year in jail, it comes with no jail time and even you can usually avoid going to court in the first place. So in addition to those benefits, there's also some positive side effects that can come from this. The first is like I said, it does not necessitate arrest when you have a summary violation. You could literally just be handed a ticket like you were in a traffic, traffic violation or something. It also comes with easier expungement. So after five years, if you don't have any more arrests, it can get cleaned off your record really easily. You also gain some protection from employment non-discrimination because in Pennsylvania, um, employers are not allowed to use summary violations when they're considering whether to hire you. And since I'm not a lawyer, I'm not 100% sure about these effects, but there's a possibility that this will have some protections for accessing student loans, professional licenses like teaching, massage, or in health. And it might also help protect you from mandatory DNA sampling after you're convicted. In the future, it could also open doors for other non-discrimination laws like in housing that protect people with different kinds of criminal records depending on how severe their, uh, their crime was. But there's also some challenges to this approach. It's not necessarily perfect. First is that the police at the end of the day still have discretion to arrest people. They can choose to abide by the state law. They can choose to charge you based on state sentencing. So this isn't gonna be some miracle cure that prevents all arrests. A second challenge is that this only applies within the city limits of Pittsburgh. 
And in fact, the only reason we're allowed to do this is that cities in Pennsylvania have a special uh, charter called a home charter, um, which might not work in your state. So this approach of passing a local law that overrides state law might not be legal where you live, but it's worth a shot at looking. A third challenge is that this approach does require police to be trained. So if we pass this ordinance, but none of the police officers on the ground know about it, it's obviously gonna be useless. And then lastly, we still aren't exactly sure whether this approach does meaningfully reduce charges, arrests, and conviction. Um, we need a little bit more research from the marijuana context to see what kind of effects it has. But despite all of these challenges, um, our group decided to go ahead and introduce this approach in Pittsburgh to try to make it happen. So the first step in doing this was to write, write an ordinance, write the actual legal laws. Um, we had it modeled after the existing cannabis ordinance and a lawyer did help us write it, but the language is actually pretty simple. Like I can understand almost every word in here and I helped edit some of the language too, despite not being a lawyer. It's nice and short, just one page. And um, the thing on the screen here isn't completely accurate. There's been some draft changes since then, but for the most part, it's a simple one page bill. The next step we did was to make a simple website. I super recommend this if you're working on an initiative like this, because it's much easier to point people to a central place with public information if, for example, the ordinance text gets updated or if the dates change on a meeting. Um, and it's, it makes your initiative look much more professional um, when you need to win the approval of bureaucrats and politicians and things like that. A third step and arguably the most important one is building a coalition behind you. So we reached out to organizations from health drug harm reduction, the queer organizations, sexual violence, feminist and racial justice organizations might be sympathetic as well. And then also don't overlook things like more progressive religious churches. Um, for example, Jewish organizations in town have backed us as well as non-traditional political groups like the libertarians um, or nonpartisan groups. We also did a lot of outreach to individuals by tabling at places like Pride, where you wanna walk around with a business card or a little flyer you printed out at the library and hand it to people and ask their org to sign on because face-to-face -face will always get you more responses than an email. Uh, another step we did that may or may not make sense in your area is to get some data to back up the reasoning behind this ordinance. So I do recommend this if you have the skills in your network. Um, accessing arrest data can be a pain in the ass depending on where you live, but if the data is accessible, this can be a really powerful tool for backing up your claims that illustrate, for example, gender and racial disparities in arrests. So here in Pittsburgh, we found that out of the 695 arrests related to prostitution, only a tiny 3% involved any type of violence or coercion. So what this implies is that most of the people being arrested are just everyday workers, not edge case scenarios that are actually dangerous. Another thing we found in Pittsburgh is that Black Pittsburghers were much more likely to be arrested for prostitution than white people were. And I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this trend will probably hold in your city, but it helps to get the data to back it up. An important and annoying step is also finding a sponsor. So this is a tough thing to do if you're not embedded in the political sphere I'm not super embedded in the political sphere of my city, um, but some things you can do are consider asking your own representative first. You wanna ask people in your network, the queer orgs, the drug reform orgs about which city councilors might be sympathetic to this kind of thing. 
Then you want to go on their websites, look at their press releases, and assess whether you think they're going to be on board. Once you have a few people that you think might be good targets, you definitely want to show up to their events. They'll support you if you support them. And then the last tip I always recommend is to befriend a staffer. So staffers uh, are, their job is basically doing all the work for the city councilor behind the scenes. So if you can look on their website and find the names and emails of staffers, try to get to know them or get in contact with them, they're the people that are gonna actually help push this through at the end of the day. And arguably the most painful step so far has been getting city stakeholders on board. Um, the goal in this case is to get important city agencies so that they are not opposing the ordinance. So that they're not putting up a big front or sounding the alarm to anti-trafficking orgs or other organizations in town that might not like this ordinance. And it's even better if they end up supporting the ordinance. But again, the baseline goal is that they're not surprised that they know the ordinance is coming and that they're not going to put up a front against it. So we had to meet with members of the police department, including the vice squad, officers that specialize in trafficking and victim services. Our city councilor talked to the police chief. We'll end up briefing every member of city council before this int gets introduced. And we'll also try to get the district attorney on board as well. Another optional step that we're currently working on is getting media coverage. So this may or may not make sense for you. If you're concerned about backlash, for example, you might want to avoid media coverage. Um, if you're able to just pass this quietly and have an effect, that is just as good. It doesn't need to be on social media to have a material effect. I would definitely recommend revisiting the spoke subclasses related to media interactions. They're super great resources. Um, we just wrote a press release and are working on getting nice, quotable three sentence quotes from people in the community. And another tip I have is that if you are um, having an event for media coverage, you want to make it visually friendly if you want visual coverage. You're much more likely to get social media, newspaper, and TV coverage if you have something to look at they can post. So for example, for our event, I just purchased 15 red umbrellas and we're gonna use those somehow because it'll make a good photo. And then the last step that we're excited about happening in the next few months for us is to get the ordinance up for a vote. Um, so this will involve a lot of waiting, first of all, because all legislation works on its own timeline. But on our end, we'll be prepping volunteers who are ready to give comments. We'll be offering talking points that they can use, knowing that at the end of the day, they're going to tell their own story and their own opinion. And by this stage, you'll ideally already know whether the ordinance is going to pass. If you are unsure or think it's not going to pass, it might be worth scrapping to avoid negative press coverage, to avoid losing allies, and to instead go back and shore up more support for next year. But I'm Josie Oakley again. I'm part of the coalition in Pittsburgh called For Safer Sex Work. And you can find a lot of our materials at forsafersw.com. Um, and I'm delighted to be here and to learn from all of my peers. Thank you. Thanks, Josie. Next, we have Allison Schulte, a queer identifying pelvic health specialist and former sex worker, passionately advocating for destigmatizing taboos around human sexuality to advance social justice. They are the executive director and founder of the nonprofit Pelvic Sanctuary and are excited to introduce their presentation, Pelvic Floor Whore, Sex Worker Advocacy in Pelvic Health. My name is Allison Schulte. Uh, I also go by Al. My pronouns are they, she, 
and um, I have been in sex work, um, in and out of sex work since 2002. I have done everything from like couture fetish fashion modeling to um, I worked as a pro dom for five years in Finland and escorting and um, yeah. So I also have worked in multiple archives um, that focus on archiving human sexuality. So I've worked at the Kinsey Institute. Um, I've worked at the Tama Finland Foundation and I've worked at the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago. And more recently, I became a licensed physical therapist assistant um, with a focus on pelvic health specialization. And uh, that has all culminated into me founding a nonprofit called Pelvic Sanctuary. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. We have a zine called Pelvic Floor Whore. So I'm going to share with you our um, Allies of Sex Workers edition of Pelvic Floor Whore and how to use it and a little bit about why we created it. So this is the cover. And this is a little more info about Pelvic Sanctuary. Our mission is to destigmatize and decolonize pelvic health um, through education. And um, we, uh, we focus primarily on creating services that support the needs of LGBTQIA plus and sex worker populations. And there, um, this issue is focused on disparities in healthcare, specifically pelvic health in relation to sex workers who frequently encounter stigma and judgment from healthcare providers. And I'm just gonna scan over the zine rather than read everything because it's going to be available for you to download and work with on your own. Um, so we have a list here of some of the obstacles that sex workers face in healthcare. Um, that includes stigma and judgment, uh, lack of cultural competence. That's one I focus on a lot. Um, uh, limited access to services, assumptions and stereotypes, um, fear of disclosure, that's also a big one. Um, if you can't be fully open and honest with your healthcare provider about your lifestyle and practices, um, they really can't um, meet your needs. So, and these are some of the potential occupational effects that are specific to sex workers um, that maybe uh, healthcare workers don't always think about in their treatment plans. Um, but just repetitive physical strain from doing repetitive movements, um, things directly related to um, sexual practices, um, in some cases, a higher instance of STIs, uh, trauma and violence. Um, it's very important that healthcare providers are trauma informed. Um, inconsistent healthcare access. And um, I might have made a note in here about being judgmental and that uh, licensed healthcare professionals usually are required to take uh, an oath. Um, and this can, you know, if you can look up their title, so physical therapy code of ethics and you can find notes in there and in and, and there you will find um, notes about uh, taking an oath to not discriminate. So um, I like to just highlight that and remind everybody of that from all sides. And these are just some other considerations. And then I made a list of um, uh, other barriers. So these are these are um, st statistics that I found and put into the zine so you can read through. So you have some supporting statistics and sources you can cite if um, someone's pushing back or if you also for this zine to actually convince people who might be on the fence on some of these issues. Um, so these are more statistics. 
and more supporting info. And then I made a list of um, impactful statements that people can use to advocate for sex workers' rights. Um, again, these focus on pelvic health, but um, could be applicable in other areas of healthcare. So um, you can read through these and maybe memorize one or pick one that like really resonates with you or makes you mad or that <laughs> you wanna share. So this is the list we have here. And then I just included, uh, I like to support artists. And so this is a piece by a uh, local um, artist, Kayla Tenge, who um, is, uh, she's a sex worker and she's had a really intense struggle with endometriosis. And um, she had a surgery recently. So she did this, uh, this work of art about that experience. And um, it's based on images by another local artist, Luca Fisher. And I wanted to end with that um, part of this is an open call. Um, I'm going to, uh, once I graduate Spokes Hub, I want to start um, creating more panel discussions that are direct conversations, um, sticking to our nothing about us with out us uh, um, values. Uh, I want to create uh, direct conversations between sex workers and pelvic health specialists about um, how we can improve programs and where the gaps are that need to be filled. And so I invite anyone interested, whether you're from health, health and wellness or you are um, somewhere with someone with lived experience as a sex worker um, to uh, reach out to us. And if you'd like to participate in this or offer any feedback on our programs, we're creating a lot of workshops and uh, virtual programs right now. So that would be at info at pelvicsanctuary.org. Um, our website is pelvicsanctuary.org. And uh, we are at Pelvic Sanctuary on Instagram if you want to keep up with some of our events and uh, we are a nonprofit and we're volunteer led. So you could also make a donation at PayPal to info at pelvicsanctuary.org. So all the info is there and you, I hope you will download this zine and use it and share it. You're welcome to print it and share it, distribute it anywhere in your community. And uh, I hope you'll follow us for um, more programs that we'll do in collaboration with Spokes Hub and other graduates. Thank you. That was wonderful, Allison. Up next is Anna Blue, who is a Black pansexual, ethical non-monogamous, kinky, leather, sadomasochistic, BDSM, and sex educator, pro-dominatrix, top heavy lifestyle switch, female queen. Queen Anna Blue is a proud advocate for safer sex practices, sex education, sex work, and diversity in sexuality. We're excited to introduce her project, Do Influencers Help or Hurt the Sex Work Industry? Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Anna Blue, and the title of my presentation today is Do Influencers Help or Hurt the Sex Work Industry? A look at the works of Dan Savage. So a little bit about me, who am I? Well, again, my name is Anna Blue. I'm from California. I now preside in the Midwest, I identify as a thick black, ethically non-monogamous, polyplay, pansexual, sadomasochistic, pro-dom lifestyle switch. And I'm very happy to be in this program and get certified. I'm also getting certified in sex education and sex counseling. And I want to get certified because I have a gift for teaching. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy helping and changing lives. I enjoy learning and growing. And I hope you all learned something from my presentation today. So I have a question for you all. How comfortable are you with being told you are wrong? Some of the objectives for today's presentation 
is about being an influencer, being a professional, being in the educational spotlight. And there's those times we hit it on the nail. And then there's those times where we're like, ooh, that didn't work so well. So let's go over some times where it's great to be an influencer and some of the negative sides of being an influencer. So objectives for this presentation, positive negative effects of an influencer on the sex education, sex work and sexuality worlds. What are some ways that Dan Savage has been a positive influence? What are some ways that Dan Savage has been a negative influence? How do we practice being open-minded while being professional? How do we practice critical thinking while being a professional? And how do we practice accountability and contrition when we make mistakes as professionals? So what comes to mind when you hear or read the name Dan Savage? Maybe you heard about him on TV, saw some interviews, seen his books at a bookstore or on Amazon, heard about his podcast or the weekly column he had in Seattle. What are your feelings about him? Let's think about that. So who is Dan Savage? Let's talk about some of the good things he has done. Well, he's popular for his sex advice and sexy film festival that he holds annually. He was first pretty popularized due to his sex advice column in The Stranger in Seattle called Savage Love, which he started in 1991. He is an author, he's written about seven books, he's a journalist and a self-proclaimed LGBT community activist. Uh, right now, he holds a weekly call-in podcast that he started in 2006 called Savage Lovecast, kind of off the name Savage Love. He hosts Hump, that sex positive film festival you probably heard about, where he tries to bring in topics about sexuality and sex and the LGBT community to help people kind of understand the community a little bit better. He also started um, IGBP uh, called It Gets Better Project that kind of offers hope to LGBT kids as they navigate being um, in the LGBT community as a young person and helps them come out and whatnot to their community. Some of the not so good part, well, Dan Savage is kind of known to be kind of aggressive sometimes when he brings up topics and kind of controversial. And does that really help to educate the masses? Should you use shame as a therapeutic and educational tool? And sometimes his techniques can kind of draw off of the spirit that we feel from shame. And he uses that in a way to try to teach people and change people's mind. One of his known, his most known controversial issues with, with, was, was with uh, Jesse Single when he was being interviewed by Dr. Erica Anderson. And Jesse was um, nominated to be part of GLAD, which is an organization that uh, stands for Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. So their purpose is to kind of point out when there are controversies against the LGBT community. So Jesse Sing Single, Single was doing all these interviews and talks. And one of the main ones he was supposed to talk about was about the trans community. Now, Jesse nor Dan are trans, but Jesse kept doing all these things about people that got off of hormone therapy that that stop being trans and people were like hey why are you talking about all these people that went through like conversion therapy or stop their hormone therapy shouldn't you be encouraging people to keep being their true self and so it kind of looked like hey you don't want to talk about trans people you want to talk about people that decided to not be trans so that was a little controversial where it's just like, are you really for the community or do you wanna just point out people who don't wanna be a part of the community anymore? Should we be respectful of slurs and not use them? There was, um, Dan was speaking at a college and uh, some people know Dan because, you know, he kind of, you know, popularized the term slut. He is contributed to 
making up the word pegging. And at this college talk he was giving, he kept using the word tranny. And students kindly asked him, can you not use this word? And he was just like, no, I'm gonna keep using it. And certain slurs aren't used in, in communities because it's hurtful, it has a dark history. And so when a group of people tell you, hey, this slur hurts me, maybe you should listen to them and not use it. And don't just be like, I'm gonna say it anyway. And so that was pretty bad for him because Dan looks like, you know, the, the mature cis white guy who's going around saying tranny. And it's like, again, are you helping the community? Question for you. Are all educators and people in the spotlight perfect people? You see these people on social media and in the news and on TV and movies and all that. And it's just like, wow, you know, they're popular, so they must be right, right? And it's like, mm, not, not all the time. Be careful who you follow and look up to. Kind of like that saying, be careful when you meet your heroes because your heroes might be doing some unheroic acts or say some unheroic things. So some of the positive influence of influencers. Well, you get to spread information to isolated areas. During the pandemic, that was probably the highest or the height of my virtual classes because people still wanted education. Still, People still wanted to learn about the kink and BDSM community and about sex work. And so um, TikTok you know, and Instagram and Twitter are great for helping people learn some things. Also, you learn diversify things because you, you scroll for hours at a time sometimes and you just see different people's viewpoint and you learn so much stuff. Also, some influencers are just funny. Sometimes you're just online just to get a laugh. It's a nice distraction. And for some people being an influencer, it's, it's a source of income. And I would say that's a positive for some people. Some of the negative influences of in influencers. Sometimes influencers are spreading incorrect information. Sometimes they're encouraging damaging behavior. Sometimes they're selling bad products. And then you have the people where they present this fantasy life that they have, this fake persona, where they make it look easy to be or do whatever they're doing. And then sometimes you start to feel bad about your own life and your own self-image and confidence and wonder like, well, how come I can't be like that? Are positive and negative always subjective? Positive and negative for who, for who, you know, you'll have some influencers or leaders or teachers or concepts and sometimes politics where you're just like, oh, this is great for that group of people, but not that group of people. Or, hey, this will help, you know, raise the income of this group, but not this group. And so how do you really separate like, hey, this influencer is good versus this influencer is bad because it really depends on what group you're in and what they're saying. Like, how is it harming another group? How is it helping? Terms, labels, and bios. Oh my, there's a lot of terms and labels that we use to help people identify and understand who they are. And labels and terms help us relate to other people. And so they're not a bad thing. They're just a way to help people understand. Sometimes labels and terms also help us build self-confidence as we kind of understand our own identity and orientation and sexuality. Sometimes you might use certain labels with certain groups. Maybe with one group, you might use the term, you might say, hey, I'm bi. With another group, you might be like, hi, I'm pansexual, if you think that they know a certain term. And new terms and labels are being made all the time. And it can be a lot of work sometimes to keep up with that. Sometimes it's easy to just go, are there, are there too many labels? Like, how do, we, how do we handle this? Can new stuff, like those new labels and terms, hurt more than help? And so that's, that's a deep question we kind of have to ask ourselves, especially as educational professionals. Like, is that a good thing, bad thing? 
How do we do this? Tolly Amory, T rhymes at P except after D for Dan Savage. So some of you might have heard that uh, Mr. Dan came up with a cool nifty term called Tolly Amory. And I kind of believe this term might not be beneficial for the sex community. And let's break it down. So toll is Latin for tolerance. And the definition for tolyamory is partner A is tolerant of partner B having outside of their relationship, sexual relations, even if that means the partner is cheating. Tolyamory sounds like another cool word, polyamory. Poly is Greek for many, a more Latin love. Now, tolyamory can get confused with polyamory. And true polyamory is about consent. Polyamory can be confusing for people because it's like polyamory already has a negative connotation to it to some communities out there. And when you make up a term that is definitely not consensual, not positive, and is confusing, it makes the true term polyamory just even more look even more bad and confusing. So how it does not help how polyamory does not help the sex positivity is that you just made another word for cheating. And it's confusing people with polyamory who already have a negative views on polyamory and non-monogamy already. What's a better term, word, phrase for for polyamory? Well, do we need a term that basically describes, hey, my partner's having relationships and being sexual with people without telling me, and I do not like this, but I will not discuss my discomfort with my partner, hence the term tolerance part. Polyamory is not about tolerance. And this new word polyamory is going to make people think that polyamory is about tolerance, is about cheating. Labels and terms are supposed to help not confuse, supposed to be educational, not disruptive. So summary, as professionals, as influencers, use your influence wisely. And it's not if, it's when, you will be wrong. Try to be as accurate as possible, ask for help, and be accountable if you're called out about something. Just admit it and go like, okay, what can I do to do better next time? Remember, we are lifelong students. We're always learning. We're going to make mistakes. Just pick yourself up and try again. And people can relate to your humanness where they go like, oh, okay, you messed up, but you let us know and we're going to be on the right track again. Because sometimes being aggressive and controversial is not always productive and educational. Critical thinking and being open-minded are important. When we come up with terms or when we speak, we need to think of both sides of issues. Or sometimes there might even be more than just two sides. We need to be open-minded, watch our own biases, understand that people that we are talking to are gonna have their own biases too. We all come from different cultures, different environments, and we're gonna be influenced by different things. So we need to be careful when we're trying to teach others about things because sometimes it can be tough to change our views and open ourselves up, but that's something we have to practice as professionals, especially when we're in the spotlight. So thank you for attending and have any questions, there's my email, the queen at queenannablue.com. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Next, Kiki is a core organizer with Swap Hawaii and gives time to multiple community-focused advocacy spaces like Oahu's Reimagining Safety Coalition, Sex Workers Giving Circle, and Sex Workers Liberation Project. Kiki earned her bachelor's degree in social science and is a writer, sex worker, and community advocate. Now for her graduation project. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Kiki Walker. I am a community organizer 
a former sex worker giving circle fellow, board member with the Cupcake Girls, mental health educator, and a writer. And I chose to um, do my presentation for graduation on forms of writing as our outlets. So we can explore multiple forms of writing rooted in our own experiences as sex workers. So first I wanted to explore, why should I write? Um, I wanna offer that there are many reasons we should choose writing as a form of expression. Some of those that we'll get into today briefly are personal, archival, grant writing, as a side hustle, and for community connection. So first is personal. Um, personal writing for me is really a way to express, reflect, and process our emotions. Um, so journaling is a great way to begin to flex that, um, to flex our writing muscles. We can use this as a space that doesn't have requirements to process our days, our emotions, and our dreams. When you're journaling or doing personal writing, this is a space for you to embrace your own voice without any edits that are needed. And some examples of personal writing include poetry, creative writing, and also dream journaling. So there are many ways to explore this. Next is as an archival of our experiences. Archives offer us the remembrance of those that have come before us. Our journals and our own writings can also serve as archives. And correct accounts of history allow us to um, reflect on those remembrances and we combat the erasure of ourselves as sex workers when we're able to create archive. And some folks really find a lot of interest in archival writing or finding other people's work and archiving it themselves um, in video or in, in book form. And really this just allows us to tell the full story of ourselves and the many ways that we exist in the world. And a great person um, that I wanted to highlight is Maya Angelou. Um, as, as not just an archival writer, um, but as, you know, a civil rights leader and an educator. And she says, I would admit where I had been, and they could see that, and they could realize that you will encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. It may even be necessary to encounter the defeats, to know who you are, and how you can rely on yourself, and where you can pull yourself from. So again, that's Dr. Maya Angelou, a best-selling author, civil rights leader, and educator. Maya Angelou was also a mother, a daughter, and a sex worker. So this is a really great example, as short as it may be, to just um, show us what archival writing can offer us in the future. We can look back on these really powerful moments and um, be able to move forward in our own experiences. Next, sex worker skills transfer. Many of us are already experts at writing. There are ad writing, conversations with clients, building brands around different experiences. And just by tapping into what you already know, you can venture into new paths with your writing. So I wanted to offer that um, while writing might seem intimidating, many of us already have that base that we can pull from and be able to use in all of these different forms. Next is grant writing. So building on those skills of storytelling, reflection, um, we can also add in research. And grant writing is a path where we can explore on ways to fund our work in our communities for our own dreams and the dreams of the lives of sex workers in our communities vastly. And through Spokes Hub, there was already a really great Grant Writing 101. Um, I encourage everyone to check out. That was facilitated by Carlton B. Bell II, our CJ. 
And then another space for folks to explore is GATE. Um, so they also offer a grant writing proposal course for trans and non-binary individuals, and it's completely free. GATE also has a downloadable proposal writing toolkit on their website. And then another space to explore grant writing when the opportunity opens up again this coming year is the Sex Worker Giving Circle. I really encourage y'all to check them out and apply. It's where um, I personally was able to learn a lot about grant writing, the process in philanthropy, and grow with other folks that had that same interest. Then we have side hustle writing. So making our money is really important and I wanted to offer a fun space um, for you to be able to also make money. So you can explore writing for blogs, starting your own blog, or writing for magazines, academia, etc. cetera. Um, this is like an example on the side of a blog that I wrote um, and I got paid $75 to write that. So it can be a really lucrative little side hustle. Sex worker voice is really valued and desired as we continue to fight for our own visibility across spaces. So the, the more our stories are being told, the more people are able to, again, touch on those archives, the more people want to involve us in their writing spaces. And another great space to um, explore having a side hustle or being, being able to be funded through your writing is Spokeshub. Um, submittable and be a freelance blogger.com. Um, there are many others, but these are some spaces that I really encourage folks to check out first. Some more writing spaces for us to look at are historical deep dives that compare with solid research and reporting, um, flash fiction or short stories unexpected interviews in your community. So maybe interviewing folks that folks wouldn't um, generally hear from, cultural criticism through the lens of a sex worker, you know, talking about different literature, film, art, or pop culture. Uh, profile pieces. So that's writing that's done on a figure or somebody in our community. Humor pieces and underrepresented magazine storytelling formats, such as comics, listicles, or historical taxonomies. And some community connection spaces I wanted to offer for folks. Um, so Sex Worker Writes, this one was from March 2024, so it's already passed, but I encourage you to reach out to Sex Worker Writes and see when the next writing space is gonna be coming up, um, but they offer dedicated times virtually as well as studio in-person time as well. I believe they're located on the East Coast. And then the other that I wanted to offer for West Coast folks is the Poetry Brothel in LA. Um, their next one is coming up in August on the 17th. Some more content worth exploring for inspiration as a writer or to see the different forms of how writing can be used. I wanted to offer a few books. Um, so To Live Freely in This World, Stone Butch Blues, and Revolting Prostitutes, as well as Hustling Verse, Thriving in Sex Work, and Body Autonomy. So these are the past few books that I've um, personally read and I think they explore all these different avenues that we've already spoken about um, and can just offer some more inspiration for you. And I wanna end with saying that writing can be a beautiful and movable practice that has the power to really support us, inspire us and reveal us to ourselves. If you have any questions or just wanna connect, I have my email listed here. Um, and starting October 6th, I'll be starting a monthly BIPOC sex workers writing space. Um, you can connect to that through that email as well, which is BIPOC SWWS at gmail.com. Thank you for your time.
That was great, Kiki. Now welcome KWD, an active sex worker since 2018. They advocate regularly with organizations such as the Ishtar Collective and Oregon Sex Workers Committee. They also work in Northeast state houses on behalf of full decriminalization and any related healthcare, gender, and LGBTQ plus legislation. They are always working to support the Rights Not Rescue movement, inclusive sex education, and the right to safe intimacy. Now introducing their presentation, Processing Grief Through Sex Work. Um, hi, welcome to Processing Grief Through Sex Work as discussed by me, KWD. Um, a quick content warning, there will be discussions of death, addiction, suicide, and overdose. Um, and a quick note on language. So I use some words interchangeably, not to the detriment of either word or in a way that is meant to baffle. Um, but I think it is important to confirm that we are human rights advocates. We are sex workers rights advocates. We are LGBTQ rights advocates. You can't separate those. And a stripper is a dancer, is a sex worker. And a sex work is work, is a job. And a client is someone who uses adult services in person, virtually, occasionally, or often and also someone who uses government services, such as healthcare aid, filing taxes, or a public library. Um, who the hell am I? So I am a first generation sex worker to the best of my knowledge, based on all of the interactions I have had with my family during the slow coming out process as a stripper. I have been a sex worker since 2018, taking time off only during parts of the COVID-19 pandemic and after my dad passed in 2021. I was a bouncer, DJ, doorman, bartender, and dancer at the first club I worked at, and I was young and a little drunk, but I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Uh, I transitioned to try other forms of work during and after the pandemic, and have quickly fallen in love with my hobbies and clients. I've been a sex workers rights advocate now for full decrim since my second year of SUNY, when I transitioned out of primary education and into sociology and women's gender studies um, programs. Um, crying on the job. Anyone can do it. So what are side effects of grief? Um, these were collected from a few books that I read in, when I was processing my grief actively a few years ago, uh, including well, knowing these things really helped me transition into what life is going to look like now. Um, emptiness and despair and confusion, those things will come and go. Um, and the grief flu which was something I hadn't heard of before, but involves how your brain is so busy processing the death or the sudden loss of someone, um, it forgets to send help to the rest of your body. So you might experience a cold or that's where things like lethargy come in and things where a change in appetite come in or low concentration. Um, where do we hide grief? In anger at ourselves, at those who have passed, at strangers, are we short circuiting on the phone with customer service because we are mad at the wait time or because we are left with a mess to clean up when someone had to go and pass away? Uh, tardiness, which manifested for me as a one-two punch of time blindness and lethargy, brain fog, and I promise your rational thinking will return one day, and memory loss. The brain is so busy processing what just happened. It will have trouble recalling even the most important information in that moment. And this can go on you know, for as long as it takes your own self to heal. Um, how does grief appear in our work? So this is the juice. So for me, I've seen it in three really specific and pivotal ways. Um, clients who are grieving loss of partners or family, and how can safe intimacy possibly be considered a human right? But that's what I'm here to advocate for. Uh, clients who may be struggling with mental health or depression, the Illinois Department of Health, who seems reliable enough, shares that suicide is the number eight cause of death in men. Although unintentional injuries is number three, and I feel like there's something to unpack there. And then for us, the grief that we try to check at the door, but might see triggered. Unfortunately, as adults, we must navigate our own emotional reactions and sometimes as a response to others. How can we redirect and refocus to ensure that no one, not even ourselves, get hurt? Um, the work of emotional labor. It is this big, loud secret that Americans are afraid of therapy. It is also this big, loud secret that most often the people who are engaging in consensual adult industry are men with money and looking to provide some of that excess income to people without. 
Um, is it a far stretch to ask, are sex workers therapeutic? And I would like to pose a real world example for discussion. A friend of mine has a client who reached out to her in February. His wife, Molly, uh, name has been changed, passed from a long battle with cancer in November. His wife was blonde, my friend is blonde, and he spends most of their sessions speaking only of his past wife and with consent requests that she be Molly when she feels comfortable. But where are all the resources? Um, during researching this, I found it incredibly hard to find things that had really tangible things to say about or sexual relations while grieving or after, when you're ready after grieving. Um, grief never really goes away. Um, instead, we grow around it. I found Sex After Grief written by Joan Price. Um, who discussed not just something directed towards widows, which is what I was finding, or chapters suggesting to, of course, go at your own speed, um, but Price included a chapter called Massage or More, discussing the importance of sex workers and similar providers can have to those who are only looking to feel connected to another human again, not necessarily start dating or to get married again. I have processed grief with a sex worker before. I happened to be near a club where an internet personality I felt was a strong and stable mind, a fine leader, an incredibly talented dancer, and an accomplished educator was working. So I gathered up the courage to go in on an early Tuesday evening, bought a couple lap dances, and cried with this person on my lap. They were, they had recently experienced something similar to the death that I had experienced, um, and I knew that they would understand, and they did not care for that, and feel better for having done it. I have also processed grief as a sex worker. I knew that I needed to seek out therapy if I was going to be a provider that could check my emotional wounds at the door. I needed to process the things that I was feeling so that they wouldn't come up accidentally with a client or on the job or even in advocacy. And to some points to advocate along the lines of mental health, when we are well-versed in language surrounding healing our own emotional wounds, we can speak on our experiences as a way to educate others. We can provide a space for those around us to feel safe exploring previously painful thoughts. And in general, to date responsibly as an adult, it involves taking care of our emotional baggage so it does not spill onto those we love. We can advocate that someone with little to no experience dating could really benefit from hiring a professional for guidance, someone who's nervous to start dating again. Um, and specifically from Sex After Grief, uh, there was a sex worker, Corinne, who states seeing a sex worker is more than sex, sometimes about getting some of those feel-good brain chemicals back. And if you are unsure about seeing a sex worker when you are grieving, wait. We can't fix things for you or make things right, but when you are ready, we can help you to feel connected to a human again with no judgment or expectations. Seeing mental health disasters at work. So how do you know when you need your hard hat or your thinking cap? Is this client being obscene or is this client struggling with loneliness or depression? I have had clients come up to me and say that they have attempted or they were thinking of attempting. And how do we process that quickly on the job? We're not uh, certified in, most of us are not certified in that kind of mental health help, but all of a sudden we have to be. And what happens if we have a client struggling with addiction? Uh, to share a personal story, I had a friend who had a client come to see her dance whenever he felt like instead he would go and spend that money he would have spent on drugs, on the girls and on the club. Uh, but one night he did get into a fight and he was banned from that club and he overdosed a couple of weeks later. How do we process that? Grieving the loss of clients to death like that or to respect? And that comes with even... Um, layers of things like the loss of a steady income or the loss of a friend, if you consider your client's friends. Um, and then this is uh, an excerpt by Susan Walsh from the book Horphobia about a client that she had that committed suicide um, after they had known each other only a couple, couple of days. Um, when I was a young stripper, uh, I had inappropriate for work behavior um, as aligned with my current goals. Um, having danced and entertained and de-escalated, sober and intoxicated, I prefer to be the party when I am in a sound state of mind and body. I grieve not knowing what I did and heard and who I saw while I was intoxicated on the job. And 
bringing that back around to addiction, what happens when a client comes in struggling with addiction and you are too? How do we check our own self, our own emotions, our own troubles to provide better services to this person, to be a listening ear without bringing in our own issues? Um, what I look out for now as best I can are actions typical for thoughts, typical for and thoughts said aloud that a person committing serious self-harm might display. This person is shot now. What kind of support system does this person have at home? If someone comes to me and they're in their um, mid to late 20s or early 30s, they're unconventionally attractive, I wonder, are they coming to me because they're considering leaving this world? Are they coming to me to get an experience that they haven't had yet? Um, and what can I do to remind them that they will be missed and that there is so much life out there to live? And of course, you are in charge of you. So in our advocacy, what happens when we have trauma dump stories imposed on us while in a state house, or we're asked rude and personal questions while tabling and on the job, or come face to face with the knowledge that healing isn't linear? How do we stay focused? Stay confident. No one knows how you are feeling until you tell them. So if you remain calm and assured in your tone, you will be believed. Take a deep breath. Continue thinking before speaking. There is no reason to ever add fuel to a hateful fire and go at your own pace. There is no timeline to processing grief. It is your grief. Um, but it's about what happens if we don't process the pain of grief. And not to process, end up carrying that in the form of pain instead. Um, grief is one of the hardest things that we have to deal with as humans. And so a lot of the times we don't want to do it. But if you don't, it turns into self-medicating, or it turns into hiding or running, it comes out in toxic ways, it spills out into your life. Um, the only way through, the only way out of grief is through grief, um, which will hopefully get us to our post-traumatic growth, which builds character as much as we hate saying that. Um, it, it helps us interact with the world in different ways. Um, and this is me an active sex worker since 2018. Um, I advocate for full decrim in any related healthcare, gender, and LGBTQ legislation. I got my starts with the Oregon Sex Workers Committee and then was able to move into working with the Ishtar Collective and other organizations here on the East Coast where I reside. Um, and I'm so excited to keep writing and speaking in ways for the Rights Not Rescue movement. Uh, with long-term goals of inclusive sex education and the right to safe intimacy. I will always advocate for the clients, resources, and that's it. That was great, KWD. They research sexuality education as harm reduction and are also in the process of launching a year-long public education program on the difference between sex work and sex trafficking. My presentation is called Behind Closed Doors, Navigating Conversations with Your Children About Work in the Adult Industry. I am a current graduate student working towards my master's in clinical social, social work, and my field research is in sexuality education as harm reduction, and I'm also working to launch a year-long program to educate the public on the difference between sex work and sex trafficking. So this is a topic that I've been asked about, and we're going to acknowledge that there's a lot of unique challenges when you're a parent who also works in the industry, and it's important to discuss our work with our children. And the goal of this pre presentation is to just share some strategies and insights onto navigating those conversations effectively. For starters, it's really important to use age-appropriate communication. Um, when I'm talking to people about how to communicate with their children, I tend to break it into three age groups. Younger children who are under 10, preteens who are between the ages of 10 and 12, and then the adolescents who are 13 or older. With younger children, you're going to really focus on those concepts of honesty, respect for yourself and others, as well as personal privacy. It's really easy to just use simple language, just such as saying that your job helps people understand things about themselves and their bodies, and that it's important to respect everyone's work and privacy. 
With preteens, you can go a little more into the complex topics of like societal perceptions, stereotypes associated with the industry, as well as legal aspects related to your work. And this is the point where we're going to start opening that dialogue to encourage questions and allowing the children to express their thoughts or concerns, keeping everything again age appropriate, providing them accurate information about your job, and still emphasizing those values of consent, respect, and integrity. Now with adolescents, as they are older, you can discuss the more nuanced aspects such as legal framework or ethical considerations and the importance of making informed choices. You're going to encourage critical thinking about how media betrays your work or societal attitudes towards it and respect their need for privacy and autonomy while this conversation is completely ongoing as they're maturing. So it's important when you're having these conversations that you choose a time and place that is comfortable and understand that you might be the person who has to start this conversation. Your child might not come up to you and be like, hey, I wanna talk about your job. It might be on you to be like, all right, I wanna have a conversation about what I do for work and explain it a little bit. Um, the big important thing though is encouraging those questions. You want them to ask as many questions as they feel comfortable. Now, when it comes to the questions, it is really important that you choose appropriate language when asking and answering them. You want to use language that your child's comfortable with, but also language that they can understand. So with younger children, you might want to just say you make videos for grownups or you help adults with entertainment. Just kind of the same way that like there are shows that kids watch and kids find entertaining. Whereas with older children, you can talk about creating content for mature audiences and that you're like a professional performer in the entertainment industry and equate it more to like movies and things like that where actors and actresses perform for very specific audiences. Now you will most likely get emotional responses and you have to acknowledge those and also validate those emotions. Um, most kids will respond in one of three ways, either through confusion, curiosity, or concern. I've noticed that concern tends to be the older kids, like the preteens and teenagers. Um, I personally had a preteen when I was doing this sort of work and they were super nervous about how their friends were going to perceive them as they got older, if they were to find like the work I do. Um, so we just kind of sat down and talked about it and came to like, why? Why are you worried? Like, where is the worry? And a lot of it was, well, I don't want them to think that like my parent is doing something wrong. Like there was a lot of shame. So we sat there and unboxed all that shame. And eventually we came to a really good place where now me and my child have a really great open dialogue, open relationship around a lot of things. Now the three or five principles that I talk about a lot are respect, consent, personal integrity, mutual respect, and understanding. So you'll hear me say those words a lot. Those are kind of the five values and principles that I've built my life on and it is really easy to reflect those in the industry as well. So a big concern that a lot of folks have is privacy and safety, especially when it comes to people who have small humans, we want to protect them. So some suggestions would be using stage names or pseudonyms and making sure your online presence is very secure. Make an email account just for this. If you're going to do phone work, have a phone number and a phone just for this. Also make sure you, have someone who can look over your legal agreements to make sure that the contracts have confidentiality clauses when it comes to your personal information. Uh, legal agreements are always going to use your legal name. So you want to make sure that that information is not going to be released. Also having safety measures, making sure that the site you're working on uh, respects labor laws, respects health and safety standards, ethical guidelines, etc and that they have trained personnel should an accident occur. It's also really important to set boundaries. 
make sure that you set boundaries between yourself and your work and keep those boundaries solid. Now, external reactions are the big thing that a lot of people worry about. You worry, how am I going to be perceived in the world out there? So some examples or suggestions would be making sure you're just honest. Be, be clear, have uh, empathy. And I am a big person about education. I believe that there's a lot of stereotypes and misinformation and lack of information around what we do. So I believe that education is super important. Um, some things that I will recommend to people are websites that provide industry news and professional insights like XBiz or ABN, um, documentaries. Everyone in, has time to sit around and watch a documentary, but Netflix's Hot Girls Wanted is like really great, as well as Amazon Prime's After Porn Ends. Some books such as Pornland by Gail Dines and The Pornography Industry by Sharia Tarat. They approach it from more of a sociological culture perspective. Um, but again, you're going to keep it all age appropriate. Now, as far as for yourself, there are a lot of professional organizations out there, such as Free Speech Coalition, the Adult Performers Advocacy Committee, or IPAC. Um, and these are organizations that are there to help you with opportunities for networking, support, resources. There are counseling services such as Pineapple Support or the Adult Performer Advocacy Clinic, which is the APAC clinic. Um, there's social media groups. And there's also the Adult Industry Resource, which is AIR. It's this uh, online forum that is performers and former performers and business people and it's just a really great like community to bounce ideas off of if you don't have that community around you in like real life. So this last slide is just kind of a umbrella of going over everything and how we can support our children. It's really important to understand your child's developmental stage. The ages that were given earlier is kind of just a baseline. If your child is more mature or maybe a little less mature, you might be able to adjust it a little differently. Younger children tend to need simple explanations, again, focusing on that respect and the boundaries, whereas the older children can handle the more dis complex discussions about societal perceptions and what our careers actually entail and things like that. The one big thing I always recommend is start early and be proactive. It's really great to have these age appropriate conversations right at an early age, talking about consent and boundaries and respect for yourself. And then this way you can just build on that as they're getting older. You're not just all of a sudden when puberty hits diving into the conversation. <laughs> um, but again, using that age appropriate language and age appropriate concepts is really, really important. You also want to focus on the positive, focus on the empowerment, the professionalism, and how it how great it makes you feel. Put it into a positive light. It's that's the easiest way to address all the stigma and misconceptions around the the community and things like that, because you you're living it. You are living proof that it's okay. You're going to encourage questions and open dialogue. As I said, you might not get questions when they're younger, but as they get older, especially when they hit that preteen teen age, you're gonna start getting the questions. Um, but letting them know from the beginning, like, hey, if you have a question, just feel free. Um, you're going to wanna make sure though, you do set those boundaries and make them have them understand, like, this is a private thing. This is a private thing. This is not something that we go out and talk about, like, everywhere. It's, it's a private conversation, but you have to be prepared to continue these conversations. Like I said, it's not going to be a one and done. It's not going to be a, Hey, we sit down and talk for an hour and then we never talk about it again. You're going to have to continue these conversations. And also too, if you feel uncertain and overwhelmed, don't 
feel like you can't go out and seek support for yourself. Seek out a therapist or counselor or even a support group that specializes in family dynamics or parenting in unconventional professions. They're out there and they can offer really great guidance and really great strategies that are tailored specifically to your situation. These strategies are kind of a broad, like, this is like a starting point. But if you need something tailored more towards yourself, there are professionals out there that can help you. And that's all. Thank you. Work on Stokely is an industry veteran of 15 years, beginning as a dancer and finding her way into dungeons and content creation. She now has taken her knowledge and is applying it to educating and outreach work. We're excited to introduce Brooklyn's piece, The Line That Binds Us. Hello and welcome to my art piece. My acrylic art piece vividly captures the deep and often overlooked struggles of sex workers as they navigate a world that stigmatizes and marginalizes us by juxtaposing the sex workers quest for legitimacy to see the light of day against the symbolic thin blue line of the police the artwork challenges the viewer to reconsider societal perceptions and biases. The thin blue line, typically seen as a symbol of the police force standing between order and chaos, in this piece represents an oppressive barrier that prevents sex workers from achieving recognition and respect and even simple safety. This inversion suggests that the real corruption lies within the police and legal system, which is often complicit in perpetuating injustice and discrimination against vulnerable communities. The use of acrylics with textured materials added to bring multiple layers brings out vibrant, stark contrasts, emphasizing the dichotomy between the perceived dirtiness of sex workers the true beauty beneath it, and the actual moral corruption of the authorities. The raw textured quality of acrylic paint can symbolize the rough, unfiltered reality of these individuals' lives, highlighting our resilience and humanity. In essence, this artwork is a powerful critique of societal double standards and a call for empathy and justice for those who are often unjustly vilified. It forces the audience to confront uncomfortable truths and reconsider who is truly dirty in a system rife with inequality and prejudice. Thank you to Spokes Hub and Woodhull Foundation for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Brooklyn. The last graduate of the night is Frankie. Frankie is a sex trade and prison abolition advocate and is passionate about working as few hours as possible while achieving as much independence as possible. We're thrilled to introduce their zine, exploring their experiences. Sex work is anti-work, trading sex to escape the workplace. Hi, my name is Frankie Felix. I am really happy to be graduating with the Spokes Hub program. For my final project, I did a zine called Sex Work is Anti-Work, Trading Sex to Escape the Workplace. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get into it and read through it. Okay. So what is anti-work? Anti-work is a critique of work and jobs as we know them. It challenges the value we place on a good work ethic. It especially calls attention to the exploitation of workers under capitalism. And maybe most importantly, it urges us to remember that life is precious and we should do everything we can to enjoy it on our terms. To survive and to be seen as adults, we're expected to work at least 40 hours a week following someone else's orders, doing work that we probably wouldn't do at all or would do very differently if we had a choice. Sacrificing all this time to be bossed around prevents us from spending our time more meaningfully on friendships, on pursuing our passions, on sprawling out and lazing around like a spoiled house cat, and even on creating the world we want to live in. 
jobs can't get them, can't keep them, don't want them. It's not just that jobs suck. They're also really inaccessible. We don't live in a society that makes it easy to find and keep good work. Hiring discrimination is real. If you are houseless, trans, black, indigenous, brown, disabled, a migrant, neurodivergent, or queer, many places simply won't hire you. If they do, you might be faced with the soul-sucking negotiation of how much harassment you have to experience versus how much you have to suppress your authentic self. If you do manage to get a job, it can be hard to keep it. Lacking transportation, struggling to keep up with the job's demands, or being unable to deal with continued aggressions toward your identity are just a few factors that could end up costing you the gig and putting you back on the demoralizing job hunt. Clocking in, not clocking in. But damn it, we're still trapped in a society that requires us to pay money for our most basic human needs like food, shelter, and sexy clubbing outfits. So how do we get by while retaining as much of our time and autonomy as possible? For many of us, the answer is sex. Jobs can feel like you're trading ownership of a large part of your waking hours in exchange for financial security, if you're lucky. But trading sex feels more like surfing the turbulent waves of the market, being cunning and resourceful, keeping your ear to the ground, and strategizing how to get the resources you need to live the life you want. Trading sex doesn't require being hired by an employer. It can be done independently, with no boss telling you what to do or when you should do it. And unlike the jobs where bosses steal the bulk of the money made by workers, when you trade sex independently, you keep all the cash and goods given for your labor, and you call the shots on how to spend those resources. That's not to say it's easy. It's not, especially when the capitalist state doesn't want independent sex work to exist. Sorry. Ah, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so freedom ain't easy. When trading sex is criminalized, it's much harder to advertise your services, whether you're working on the street or finding clients online. When people do show interest, your leverage to screen for safety is at a bigger disadvantage because when clients are criminalized, they're often more reluctant to provide information or to take extra time before getting into a car or hotel. Due to the stigmatization and criminalization of sex workers and clients, the client pool is smaller and their entitlement is often bigger. With fewer potential clients, many of whom have internalized negative attitudes towards sex workers, you may have to compromise your desired rates and boundaries to make ends meet. There's also the risk of violence. Whorephobia, which dehumanizes sex workers and normalizes violence against us, is a central force in patriarchal capitalism. Since our police state wants everyone to, to depend on cops, if you do face physical and sexual assault, it's harder to find support that doesn't involve dangerous interactions with police. Because we must be so cautious about disclosing our sex work, finding each other to, support, to form support networks is harder too. When we find each other, keeping each other safe is challenging and risky because many of the ways we support each other are criminalized and can even be legally considered trafficking. If capitalism had its way, it would either eliminate us by making our trade too dangerous, draining our resources, and locking us up. All strategies that hit black and brown, trans, migrant, and houseless sex workers the hardest. Or it would own us by turning sex work into another one of their jobs, by legalizing it in ways that control exactly how and where we work, prevent us from keeping all of the money given for our services, make us work under coercive conditions of bosses and managers, and restrict our access to these workplaces by requiring the approval of business owners and government entities, which would again be the most restrictive against black and brown, trans, migrant, and houseless sex workers. So why do they make it so hard? Because we are a threat to the capitalist state. Because freedom is a threat to the capitalist state. Capitalists want us to keep want to keep us on our grind, working our bodies beyond what is healthy, building them more and more wealth and power, and keeping us too exhausted to organize for liberation. When we find ways to make money independently, that frees us from our dependence on the jobs that exploit us. It challenges the idea that we have to submit to the rules they give us in order to survive. When we don't depend on the capitalist state and the jobs it tries to trap us in, 
it loses its control over us. And with our freedom, who knows what we are capable of? How do we get that freedom and keep it? We do it together, baby. Tap into those skills that you already have. Be cunning, be resourceful, keep your ear to the ground, and strategize on how to create community with other sex workers. Connect with communities that already exist and scheme together on how y'all can be safe, make money, build power, and thrive. Doing this work alone is hard, dangerous, and alienating, but communities can help each other screen clients, steer clear of cops, exchange information to keep each other safe, and share resources for building your trade. Communities can also provide space to share about your experiences, good and bad, build friendships, and relax in a haven of people who embrace and accept you for what you do and who you are. Connect. Do you have sex worker community? If so, how did you connect to it or build it? How can you reach out to someone without it? How can you help them strategize building their own local community? If you don't have community, do you know of any other local sex workers, even if they do different types of work than you, that you could reach out to? To start, could you ask them to coffee? If there are multiple people, could you host a potluck? Get those conversations started. Are there other reachable cities with communities you can connect to? What about communities you can access online? Any sex worker conferences or festivals you can travel to to make long distance connections? Many of these events offer scholarships. Reaching out is the most powerful way to give and receive protection and love. Make the workplace your shitty ex. So let's invest in our own resources and reduce our dependence on capitalist entities. Maybe with things like money pots, where you give each month if you can and use it to help sex workers in crisis and build sustainable resources. Trade and barter markets, mutual aid, skill shares, free shops where you can gather donated items like clothes, Plan B, condoms, and COVID tests. Pop up a shop for free 99. Direct support networks like abortion, like abortion access groups and housing strategies to reduce rent, such as with sex worker roomie networks, or even for long-term saving up to buy communal housing or working spaces. Fight criminalization. Cops are the protectors of the capitalist state. Connect your fight for sex worker decrim to larger prison abolitionist struggles. Fight to defund police, close prisons, and end surveillance. Never let your abolitionist peers forget sex workers' needs and always center the people most targeted by police. By police, Be creative and love fiercely. Keep the anti in your work. As you organize, don't forget to enjoy your life and the people around you. If you simply can't do anything but survive and try to experience joy now and then, that's okay. You don't have to earn your right to exist. The objective of our organizing is to make life easier. If we set harsh, unrealistic expectations on our organizing, and judge ourselves as unworthy if we don't keep up, we'll find ourselves replicating the very workplace we're striving to escape. Make time to be lazy, to dance, to laugh, and to engage in all your nerdy hobbies and to sprawl out in the sunshine like a spoiled cat. Um, imagine freedom. Colonialism and capitalism warp life on this beautiful, abundant earth into trappings of scarcity and servitude. To keep this going, they gaslight us all into thinking that this is the only world that is possible. To escape this false reality, we must delve into our imaginations. So please imagine, what would you do if you and everyone else no longer had to worry about money? You have access to all your needs, no strings attached. You are free. Um, so feel free to talk about this with a friend, create visions in your mind, or write or draw about it. And then that's it for the zine. Um, I've got some resources and a way to read it online or print it if you go to that link. Um, thank you very much. Again, my name is Frankie and um, I'm just really happy to have been able to share this with you. And that's a wrap. Congratulations to everyone who presented and graduated today. We're so, so proud of you and thankful for the knowledge that you've shared. We know that you'll continue to make an important contribution to the world through your advocacy and public education. And we're especially looking forward to offering financial support for that critical work through the awards pool. 
Spokes of classes are still open to you, so we'll see you in class. And please consider also teaching with us. We'd also like to say thank you to the tremendous teams at the Woodhull Freedom Foundation and the LaShaw Sexual Health and Wellness Research Institute for making all of this possible. I'm also so grateful for my Spokes Hub coordinator colleagues, Moses, Jaylee, and Savannah, and the interpreters who made this possible. And for those of you watching at home, thank you for joining us today and celebrating our graduates. Have a wonderful rest of the week and take care. Wow, that was so exciting and inspiring. I'm really thrilled to have been a part of this graduation. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, and th thank you to the graduates for sharing your stories, your passion, your knowledge with all of us. Folks, if you learned something, if you enjoyed your time here tonight, please head over to woodhallfoundation.org backslash donate and make a donation so that we can keep Spokes Hub going for a very long time. Thanks again to the Spokes Hub team for putting this all together. And we'll see you next time. I can't wait to see what's in store for us.